Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region vlog and podcast. My name is Joss Brownlee and I'm joined today by Alistair Moore. Alistair, welcome. Great to have you here today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Excellent. Alistair is a Sibsey certified heat network consultant running his own practice since June 2020. His work is mostly client side, providing first and second line technical support to housing associations, local authorities, and private companies on all things heat network related. Alistair's family were involved in the construction industry and he grew up working school holidays on site for his father's company. He joined Thermalite Blocks after college as a trainee and worked in a number of departments before taking up a technical sales role in 1988. He made the transition to mechanical in 1999 as a regional manager for a German manufacturer of underfloor heating and heat network pipe work. He worked for a number of manufacturers, including Giacomini in a UK wide role. He has also worked in Europe. He currently sits on the Sibsey West Midlands Region Committee with a focus on training. From a heat network point of view, he is on a mission to save energy and increase sustainability on legacy heat network schemes and in turn help reduce fuel poverty. Welcome. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Oh, well, yeah, um, as we say, I'm a heat network consultant and I specialise client side. So um, my my raison d'etre is essentially to try and save energy and identify where that is. Um, so that's what I do from a work point of view. Personally, um, I'm married, I've got my own family, two boys, uh, both grown up and left home. And um, really, it's just um, it's just uh, the current situation where, where I'm at on that. Excellent. And um, how did you get involved in mechanical engineering? Well, that's an unusual one. Um, I got involved in mechanical engineering in that, uh, having been involved on the heavy side at Thermalite, I sort of crossed over quite a lot into architects and building services engineers. And I always thought that it was um, a bit of a more interesting um, business than I was involved in. I, uh, I quite like the technical aspect of it. And so I started, um, I started researching it a little more and tried to look at what transferable skills I had at the time that would help me move into that industry. And uh, I made the transition in 99 um, to that German company. And what motivated you to choose this direction? I think, um, I think generally in the industry, I think it, it gives you an opportunity to make a difference to, to the environment, to people. You can actually have quite an impact in what you do. And I, I thought generally being involved in the construction industry was the way I could have a good impact in you know, using my knowledge gained from my family's business. Mechanically, um, I, 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 it's just always interested me. I've always liked to see how things work and I've always been one of these that take things apart and put them back together. And uh, yeah, it's, that's what's really interested me, the complexity of it and how it all has to come together in one overall picture at the end. And college, university, school years, where, where, where was that and what did you study? Uh, well, I, I, um, I, if I'm honest with you, um, I didn't do my best at school. I didn't fulfil my potential. I went to college for a couple of years and did a, uh, basically a business studies course. Uh, since then, I retook my O-levels and I did an Institute of Management a couple of years in that. Um, but I made a point of trying to learn as much as I could on the job. I, I needed uh, more stimulation at school than I was getting, if I'm honest. And I found that on the mechanical side, particularly being shown how to do things, being shown how to draw things, going back to the old days before CAD, being shown CAD and how, how to do things like that, I was much more interesting than, than I was being taught at school. I, I think I was probably missing mentors. So what I gained in the workplace was some really great mentors that saw beyond the uh, educational background and more saw the potential. Uh, anyone in particular you'd like to, to recognise for, for mentoring and training? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a, a couple of people. I think uh, my original manager at Thermalite was a guy called Mike White, and he saw something in me that um, maybe I didn't quite at the time, if I'm honest. And um, he put me forward and pushed me quite hard. I think as well, people about passing information on. I've had the benefit of learning from um, some engineers in the past. There's a guy called Alan Sanders that currently works for Nibby that springs to mind, where, again, somebody took the time to explain something and show you something and, and pushed you into 
you know, maybe maybe spending more time reading journals and magazines and technical papers and heat network codes of practice and things like that. So those people really, you know, I, I can't thank them enough for the time that they gave me uh, to try and fulfil the potential that they saw that maybe I didn't at the time. Um, we mentioned that your um, family were in construction and was that the Thermalite Blocks business? No, no, my family were builders. So Thermalite was a local company. Um, and my family are, um, were general builders, um, building small houses, that kind of thing, extensions. And uh, as a child, I always grew up in it. I think my father, if I'm honest with you, Josh, gave me the worst possible jobs to do to try and put me off going into it, if I'm being really honest, um, which he did. Um, but I think you can't ex escape construction if it's in your blood. Uh, so I, I actually w went to work for Thermalite Blocks almost from college. And uh, and that's where you know I got straight back into it effectively. Any being sent out for a long wait? I've been sent out for a long wait. I have also, I'll put my hand in the air, been guilty enough for the next new person that joined to send them out, as was my prerogative at the time. Um, <laughs> once you've been sent out, um, you, you've got the next opportunity on the next new start. I've also been sent for the um, left-handed screwdriver, but not the bubble for the spirit level yet. <laughs> um, uh, uh, talking about uh, juniors and apprentices, any STEM or outreach activities? Not, not really on that on that side. If I'm honest with you, no, um, not 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 too much at the moment. I get involved. Um, I get involved in mentoring a number of young engineers coming through, but I don't really. It's nothing official. We have something called the Heat Exchanger Mentoring Scheme, and uh, we I mentor. Uh, last year was a relatively senior engineer uh, working for a large multinational. This year, again, it's a senior engineer but working for a small company, and we do mentoring on that. I also do a number of um, uh, loose mentoring with uh, a number of uh, junior engineers that were that just started in the industry through LinkedIn. Say that again, sorry. So I also do a bit of loose mentoring with uh, young engineers through LinkedIn. So I get a number of people contacting me asking how to get into the industry. I, I get people asking me how I got you know, into the role I'm doing and, and can they learn anything? And so I end up with a, a number, half a dozen or so, um, relatively junior engineers over the last five years, where we keep in touch every month or so on how their career is going. Totally, totally uh, confidential discussions that we have. And face to face or Teams, Zoom, those sorts of things, bit of a mix of both? Uh, I'd love to say it's face to face, but um, they've all been over the last couple of years by Teams. Um, I'll get on, I've met these people, met them on a number of occasions, but um, in reality, it's all been via Teams or on the phone. Spread across the UK or international Europe as well? No, just UK, so no international. Uh, it tends to be um, with the drawer of London, a lot of young engineers in London, but I'm working with some up in the northeast and in the Lake District at the moment. Okay, excellent. Sounds good. Um, how were you engaging in working around the transition to net zero? I think I think what from a personal point of view, or how am I impacting on it? Uh, both, really. So from a personal point of view, I think I think um, I'm, what I'm trying to do on my own net zero approach is I'm trying to make an impact on on how people view things. I think the difficulty is is that from from a net zero, it's it doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, um, even in the industry. I'm, I'm particularly finding that I'm forever ever having to repeat myself of what net zero means, and what a commitment it is. And I find probably net zero to be the most frustrating thing that I have my involvement in in the industry, in that I constantly am in discussions with clients where I'm quoting their own net zero policy off their web page and saying, do you really believe in this? If you believe in this, then you need to do something. Therefore, therefore, what is your action plan to achieve net zero? What's your strategy? What stepping stones do you have? That kind of thing. Uh, so I, I find it a little bit frustrating in that um, everyone knows what it is, but there aren't that many that have got a viable plan to achieve it. Do they come across as sort of surprised when you start to... Uh... Uh, relaying their information back to them and that sort of uh, confused look as uh, hmm yeah a little bit and 
I'm very straightforward. So I go, look, if you really truly believe in this, then do something about it. We can help you. If you don't, then let's just admit it and allow us both to move on and focus on people who really need this help. Now and again, you have to nudge, but I do find it a little frustrating that in some circumstances, it can be construed as lip service where we're dealing as engineers with the reality. We want to see actual action rather than words. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's interesting uh, seeing and, and hearing what people's aspirations are and uh, the difference and the gap between that and, and actual reality. Um, yeah, agreed. How do you see the role of um, mechanical building services engineers changed over the past year or so? In the past year, I think it's changed in that uh, people have had to adapt and improvise to the current situation. Um, I think that some have fared better than others. I think the biggest change in the last year has been the churn of people between different organisations. And that for whatever reason, the pandemic has prompted people to not accept what they've got and maybe make them change, do things quick more quickly than they planned, uh, myself included. Um, you know, I started my own company up during the pandemic and it was a case of if not now, when? And I think a lot of engineers out there have had the same thing where there's a lot of churn going on in between organisations. Hopefully that's settling down a bit. But I think the being willing to adapt to the change that's been put upon us. I've, been, I've enjoyed the change. I find this quite refreshing that we can communicate all of this. And you can be in a meeting in Glasgow and London and Oxford and Ireland in the same day. Yeah, without having the carbon miles in between as well. That's it. That's exactly it. Without having all that carbon mileage and all of the all the transportation and time that it takes as well, we've, we've got none of that. So I, I think it's been a positive change personally. Yeah, and you, you're working from home, I believe, today. Is that uh, normal for you? Have you got offices and no offices? No. So we. Um, we, uh, we run our own company, there's myself and my wife, and we, we, we work from home. So I work from an office at home. Um, but we, we spend most of our time um, with clients on site or in meetings virtual like this. Um, we also run something called a network of independent engineers, whereby we bring in other people with specialist skills on an assignment basis. So we find that this way of working works quite well in that we, we can there are small consultancies, one, two, three people organisations um, where we can pull in specialist heat pump advice for you know a client on this project, a uh, Schneider structure wear BMS specialist on this project, and we can sort of bring that whole team together. And uh, we we rarely meet, if I'm honest. We, we we find that this working from home and working remotely on site works quite well. And ground source, air source, everything. Ground source, air source. So we recently did a project uh, end of last year for Gateshead Council. We needed ground source specialist knowledge to add to my knowledge and our BMS team's knowledge. And we bought in the best we could afford and, and actually published that in our proposal. This is who will be doing our ground source heat pump um, support. In that case, it was Laura Bisher from Infinitus Design, who's also the chair of their ground source heat pump association. We bring the best in and we find that works quite well. And um, was that ground uh, slinkies, boreholes? Boreholes, boreholes then, yeah. A subsidising or supplementing, um, supplemented by a gas boiler system as well. And off the top of the head, can you remember how deep those boreholes were? And I ask because there's a, a reason for, for it, which I'll come on to in a minute. I can't, I can't at the moment, but I have a feeling as a bit of a guesstimate, it was about 300 metres. Because uh, the reason for asking is I saw in the news recently an article about doing uh, boreholes 30 kilometres deep. <laughs> I think you're, I think you're creating volcanoes with that, Josh, I think. That, right? well, that That's part of the uh, technology that uh, the um, uh, researcher was looking to do is getting down further from the, the Earth's surface to get a more stable and more reliable uh, and higher temperature, potentially, uh, source of heat. Right. Because we've worked, um, we're doing the uh, IRMA report, which is like an independent metering report for um, a, a local authority in the northeast, and they've got mine water. So you don't need to go down that far in the northeast or Midlands or South Wales to farm warm water. Um, mines are typically flooded in these areas, so we, we get involved in that quite a bit. 
Yeah, there's there's quite an interesting piece of work there. When you do have a water body or, or source close to you, then uh, there, there's a, a train of thought that says, well, let's use that as the heat source or the heat sink, you know, to, 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 to reject the heat. Um, but of course, there's uh, all the other considerations that come with uh, um, water uh, sources uh, for heat pump technologies. Agreed, yeah. Agreed, yeah. It opens up a lot of doors and avenues, but it creates your, sorry, creates your problem as well. Yeah. Um, what's your pet peeve? Oh, well, Industry-wise, um, probably my frustration is the net zero one, They're having to repeat the message. Um, my major frustration from a client point of view is that with all due respect to them, they've got their own infrastructure and big companies sometimes and big organisations sometimes don't act as quickly as we'd like. I find that when we sometimes give advice for quick wins on energy efficiency at low cost, it takes an inordinate amount of time from identifying that, telling them it, to actually getting the work done on site. Do you have any examples? Yes, I have a client where I've uh, recommended um, a, a different method of pump control on a project to slow the heat network down with the remote differential pressure sensors that will change the efficiency of that whole heat network overnight. And one year down the line, it's just being feared. Uh, and I'm, I hope not at uh, considerable cost either, but, uh, you know, the capital no. expenditure and the operational expenditure being uh, given good payback periods, I guess. Payback's great. It's almost instantaneous. I've got um, uh, three sets of pumps running flat out for all time, 24-7, um, sending uh, with a massive um, um, flow temperature, a narrow delta T temperature difference coming back, and we can almost solve that overnight. Mm. by just getting a, getting effective BMS control over the pumps using this reference DP sensor on the index. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. And the, the only final frustration is we do get asked to do a lot of free work for people. And as a consultant, uh, when you're in the area, could you just pop on this project? Basically means for free. Um, so that probably my pet pet one where the, I do find I'm saying that I actually, believe it or not, I do this for a living. It's not it's not a charity. I'll help out, you know, reduce costs on special um, special projects for charities and things like that. I'm quite happy to do that, but I don't make it, you know, I'll do mentoring and assisting, but I don't make it a point of doing free work regularly. Yeah, I mean, uh, th those frustrations with the latter uh, are, are presumably um, offset and it, you get great uh, satisfaction when uh, a recommendation does uh, get implemented um, and you can see and they can see the effects of uh, what what uh, the recommendations were I guess. Yeah that's great it, it works quite well it's just uh, so they're, they're my they're my pet uh, frustrations to be honest. Uh, so other than um, pump speed variable speed technologies what other um, elements are you, you researching and, and implementing in, in uh, heat networks uh, right uh, now? I think I think uh, I think the heat networks at the moment is lowering lowering supply temperatures. Um, what we have is um, I think we all know the figure of 80 to 85 percent of the buildings will be living and working in by 2050 have already been built. So new build to a degree um, is easier. Um, I, we tend to concentrate on the 85 percent of buildings that have already been built. So we're looking at legacy heat networks and we're looking at lowering temperatures reducing boiler loads, decarbonisation of heat sources, and trying to get the end heating under control, whether that be in a flat, um, uh, a museum, a library, a council offices or schools, it's all a heat network. We're trying to get the, the heat delivery um, as, as perfect as we can and waste as little heat in transportation from the plant room to the point of heat delivery. Well, that's really our goal. So reduced temperatures, better heat delivery and decarbonisation would be the three. With reducing the flow temperatures, um, obviously that has an effect on mean water temperature as well and presumably uh, emitter sizing and, and flow rates. Yes, it has a major impact and I think that's the biggest problem. We've all heard the issues of small ball pipe on domestic um, installations creating a problem with flow rates. It's no, really no different on uh, industrial, commercial uh, heat networks. So from our point of view, um, what we're looking to do is 
if if you're dropping the temperature to let's say 55 degrees from 75 we need considerably more flow volume through that uh, heat network to achieve the same heat output in the zone so a typical radiator sized on 75 degrees if we're running at 55 is probably 55 percent undersized um, so there's a behavioral element from a tenant's point of view where we need to I encourage them to keep their heating on for longer. You will deliver the same heat, but it will take longer to do so. The key element is getting that flow rate in the heat network um, sufficiently increased to offset that um, temperature drop so you maintain the same heat delivery, the same kilowatt output. Yeah, alternatively, I guess you could uh, have a, a larger emitter, but obviously if the physical space isn't available, then um, you can only uh, work with what you've got available. Agreed. And luckily, um, going back um, to heat network design on legacy schemes, the vast majority of them um, have been historically oversized anyway. So the pipe work luckily is of a, a significant enough size where in most cases increasing the flow volume up there is more cost effective than changing the size of the emitter. The, um, the, the, the numbers that you mentioned earlier with 85% uh, of the buildings already being built that we're going to use in 10, 15, 20 years, uh, the statistic that I thought you were going to say was the 90-50 rule, which I only heard about recently, which was 90% um, of the build, ninety percent of the time a building is operating at or below 50% of its peak demand, you know, peak, peak sizing. So, um, it may be that the tenant doesn't experience any uh, perceived or any note, noteworthy uh, changes in the performance of the system uh, following the optimizations that uh, are, are installed or, or implemented. Um, but yes, when it gets to midwinter, um, I'm guessing that uh, they they may notice that it takes a little bit longer or, or uh, you know, um, slightly longer for uh, the system or the room or the, the, the house or the property to uh, warm up to where it was prior to the changes being implemented but overall the efficiencies are there um, and they'll notice the the, the savings in the uh, monthly or, or quarterly energy bills i guess yeah i think that i think you're, you're absolutely spot on about peak load and peak design we as an industry traditionally in my view we focus too much on peak design we have access and monitor a number of systems for clients on things like Guru Pinpoint and Secure eWatch, where you can actually log on and view energy usage, consumption, flow rates on whole apartment blocks or individual apartments. And one of the metrics available on there is that it tells you what percentage of time it's running at peak. And that, that 90-10, if I'm honest with you, in most cases, is more like 95-5. Um, we're running at and one particular scheme in London where less than 5% of the year is within 5% of the peak. <laughs> so it's even, you know, peak peak is probably accounts for 1% of the year. So my main uh, point of view from a heat network consultant is not how we perform at peak because even extremely poor heat networks perform well at peak. It's how we perform during the rest of the year and how the system flexes and adapts to suit the real-time demand throughout the year rather than just the peak load design and the pumps always on full. That's my my real you know passion is to go how do we control it the rest of the year? Forget peak, peak sorted. What about every other part of the year? Yeah. Yeah. Um what's a common myth about your professional field that you want to debunk? <sighs> And that's a good question. It could be the fact that I suppose a common myth is that because you're involved in heat networks or because you're a mechanical engineer like yourself, that you know everything. And I do get, oh, you must know that. And, you know, quite a lot. And I say, I know what I know from the sum of my experiences and what the time and effort I put into reading things like I've got the SIPSI guide here on my desk right next to me to heat networks. I was reading that today as I read it at some point every day. Um, I was reading Code W today. So the biggest myth to debunk is that we don't know everything. What we do is we, we learn from our experiences and we also know that we need to continue this learning journey, which is why things like CPDs are important because we unless we continue this journey, we're mistaken in the belief that we're the finished article. And, and I for one know that I'm not, and I'm willing to admit that. 
What's the most important thing you've learned in your life? It goes back to values, to be true to yourself, honesty, integrity, and to get paid for a job or a role that you enjoy, that, you have, that you're passionate about, and that you want to, you're on that mission. So to be on that mission from myself, I think that the biggest learning thing for me journey is stick to your values, stick with your mission. And, and if you continue to do that, then, uh, then you've just got to do your best at what you do. And how's that contributed to a pivotal moment in your life or career? Uh, setting up my own e network consultancy pretty much came to that where I kept seeing the same sort of problems with clients all the time. They kept having the same problems with heat network, the same problems with value engineering, um, where there was nobody really looking at the bigger picture for a client. Individuals were picking up bits of the jigsaw and going, oh, we look after that bit of the jigsaw, and we look after that, somebody else does that. But there's nobody trying to fit these pieces together. And I found that the clients were getting to a point where even the projects I was working on, I was saying to them, look, it's not my responsibility, but you really should check how these things all integrate and how it all works together, how your metering and billing system communicates with your heat interface and your hardware, how your boilers are communicating with your pumps, how your BMS is set up. And I got to the point where I just thought they're getting a raw deal and they really have not many people out there just with a client focus, there's no other, no other involvement in the project, no emotional involvement. So I took it on myself to go, if you really truly believe that that's, you know, what the client needs, and that will mean lower bills, lower tariffs, more efficient systems, then I'd uh, put up or shut up, go and do something about it. And it was, a, it was that moment, I need to do something about it, right, when? Well, it's got to be now or never. And you set up your business during the first lockdown that must have been a, a leap of faith well it was a leap of faith but i think that everyone was taking their own leaps of faith at the time um, by staying where they were at i was on furlough so i was put on furlough on the 2nd of april like millions of others and for the first month i it was great i was in the garden in the sun and second month was a bit of a diy um, actually well it was gardening and uh, gardening and painting fences and cutting hedges and, but I think it was the second month was like a bit of a reality check or crikey. You know, am I going to have a job at the end of this? Um, am I going to am I going to be in this industry anymore? And it was more a case of going, actually, I'll rather than follow the furlough trail to the end of the road, I'll set my own company up with the blessing of my current employer, a company called Minibems at the time. And when I when I began, when I was on furlough, and uh, they took me back on part time in July, one day a week and then three days a week from September, while still allowing me to run my own consultancy, um, which was uh, really thankful to them for helping me in that. And then I got to a point in December where it was right I'm, to do this properly. I need to make that commitment and move full time. Yeah. So um, I said goodbye to Mini Bems, thank them for their help and their time and moved on in, in from January. Yeah. Um, working in the organisation that you're in at the moment, how do you uh, do uh, stay positive inside and out uh, mental health? Uh, positive mental health. So you broke up slightly there. How do I? Well, we're, we're a very small company. As I said to you, there's just a two of us. So I think from a mental health point of view, I think the difficulty of running your own business is it's quite easy to overwork. So I think when times are busy, I, we, I run quite a structured setup for my own personal working, whereby I know I'm very good in mornings at detail. I know I'm very good in afternoons at thinking. So I try and structure my work around that. And the beauty of working from home most of the time is that I, I can set myself a task and say, when I've completed that task in this two hour slot, I'm going to have a break. So I try and try and have interests outside work and I try and have focus on I won't call it work recreation work life it's work recreation because I enjoy working it is part of life um, but from a mental health point of view I think it's taking breaks and being listening to your own body and saying you know when you need to step back and Connected with work is uh, the, the, the good work that you're doing with the regional committee, the, the Sibsey West Midlands Committee. Um, what, what prompted you to join that? 
Well, I think from a networking point of view, being um, being honest at the time, I, I was working a lot around the UK and Ireland and Europe, and I wanted to, I really didn't know a lot of people local to where I live in Birmingham. So I thought the best way of doing that would be to link up with um, Sipsy. And uh, I, I asked, I think it was Richard Bailey at the time, I think I asked him how, how he got involved in it. And uh, it allowed me to to really get into networking with people in the same industry in, in the area that I lived in. It's grown on from there in that it allowed me to get involved in training. Uh, we sponsored the Young Engineer of the Year Award at SIBSI West Midlands. And I, I quite like getting involved in that side. I think as I'm getting older, I think it's about giving something back to the industry. Really uh, whether it be whether it be training, whether it be volunteering to do something when you really maybe not quite got the time to do it, but you'll make time. So I think it's about legacy and, and people helped me in the past and I want to do the same. And, and if you could turn back the time and talk to your 17 year old self, what would you say? Patience is a virtue. Concentrate, stick to your, stick to your values. Don't be in a rush. Um, and maybe be more thankful um, uh, to the people at the time that were giving you assistance and pointing you in the right direction. It wasn't always the friendliest of advice. Some of it was, you know, tough love stuff. But I think, yeah, be patient, keep on the path and uh, and stay committed and, and to your values. Um, in the news recently, there's been a lot about rising energy costs. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's um, it's become a bit of a nightmare for us all. Um, are we we at home, we're, we're discussing it, how we're going to do things. I'm, I'm putting insulation in the loft on, at the weekend, more insulation. We're talking about how we can cut down ourselves. I think the bigger issue is that I think I'm a little frustrated by the whole energy policy. We're generating energy within the UK to a degree. In some instances, we're selling it and buying it back at a higher rate. Uh, we're financing um, a wind turbine a mile from my house um, that costs far less to produce energy than the one we're buying from Norway at the moment. Yeah, I'm paying the same rate for it, and so is the government in a lot of instances. I, I think I think it's frustrating that we've got ourselves in this position. What can we do? Um, as an industry, it can only be one thing: it's efficiency, 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 and making sure that the increase in electricity prices doesn't uh, drop our target of net zero because it's three times dearer than gas because it's got a still got the higher carbon content i believe in terms of tax from the government that needs to change um gas has always been too cheap to show um heat pumps against in terms of 20-year break-even points and things like that um but i think it's probably focused the mind a lot more on efficiency uh, and and it's just trying to convince clients to invest in, in efficiency gains that they can get pretty much straight away. Yeah, I think there's uh, a, a whole piece of work that needs more consideration in amongst the net zero carbon uh, considerations as well, whereby you may be net zero carbon, but there may be uh, more opportunities that you aren't realising because of the efficiency. So, uh, yes, be net zero carbon or have aspirations to achieve that by a certain deadline, you know, 2025, 2030, whatever, but also making best use of the resources available to you and doing it in an efficient way, um, whatever that term efficiency means to you as an individual or an organisation. Yeah, yeah, there's problems with budgets as well. So we're finding clients coming to us saying, we've got 20 heat networks um, that we need to review. How much to review them all by Christmas? Okay. Uh, here's the budget for it and they'll immediately come back and go that's way too much we can't we can't afford to do that okay okay do you have a plan and a strategy do you know which your worst heat networks are no so we say okay let's let's set a bit of time aside let's work out what order of priority your heat networks are what the worst you know what in in worst heat network from 20th down to best in number one Let's look at age of plant. Let's look at which ones need optimization surveys this year, top five or six. Which ones need decarbonisation because their plant is at end of life. Let's have a strategy. Let's have a budget. Let's have a plan. And then you can sell that internally. And we're yeah. finding a little bit of panic over action now. But action now means spending money that they haven't got. 
So we're trying to bring them back down to earth gently and say, let's have a plan, let's have a strategy. Let's not just knee jerk reaction to this. Let's, 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 let's have some kind of structured approach. Yeah, and priorities as well. Yeah. Yeah, you Excellent. can budget for that. You can yeah. budget for that, and we can help them. But this bit of panicking that's going on at the moment, where you know I've got another one, I've got 105 systems, and we need them all doing right. Which ones are the worst? We don't know. Right, okay. Let's start that. Let's start that nice process going. Let's plan it in over the next year. Let's the ones that are doing really well. We might not need to see until 18 months time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and for sharing what you have. Just a couple of last questions, if I may. Sure. Uh, what do you like to do in your spare time? Uh, well, I, uh, as I've got older, I've been, I'm enjoying the garden more and more. Um, I don't know whether that's um, whether that's just a maturity thing or yeah, whatever. Um, but yeah, I've enjoyed the garden more and more. I enjoy spending time with family. Um, I've recently been on a canoeing trip down the River Wye with one of my sons, his father-in-law and a friend. And uh, we do that. Maybe a little bit of fly fishing now and again when I get time, but something that's completely different, you know, something that's just like relaxing. Uh, I enjoy the holidays as well. Haven't had any abroad um, for probably three years now, but we, we try and holiday in the UK where we can now. Any pets? No, uh, we've had, um, had a dog before for 12 or 13 years, but I think we've got to the point where it would constrain us to home if we wanted to nip away for a weekend. Uh, so we've, we haven't got any at the moment, no. And uh, plenty of water sport hobbies by the sounds of things. With what, sorry, Josh? Water sport hobbies, so uh, canoeing and fly fishing. Yeah, so the fly fishing, yeah, I enjoy the fly fishing. I find it really relaxing. I don't care, honestly, if I don't catch anything, to be honest with you. Um, I find it um, actually going out to a venue in, in the Lake District or local to where I live, and spending an afternoon uh, out with nature and um, half of it sitting on a bench um, thinking about life and things is uh, maybe not a bad thing. Yeah, turn off the laptop, turn off the mobile phone, turn off the screen, get rid of the technology. Everything off, get rid of the technology and just, just relax, yeah. Yeah. And uh, lastly, where can people connect with you online? Uh, where? Uh, so uh, most typically connections are through LinkedIn. So I've got a relatively active LinkedIn profile um, where I'm forever seem to be pushing about efficiency. Uh, we have a web page as well. Uh, the company is Fresh Heat Networks and the web page is www.freshheatnetworks with an s.co.uk. Um, as I say, we're, we're relatively well known in the industry for such a small company in a couple of years. I'd like, you know, I'm quite pleased with the people that have had confidence in us and work with us. Good. And here's to lots more of that in the future as well. Let's hope so. Excellent. Well, as I said previously, thank you very much for joining and sharing with us what you have today. If anybody would like to share their thoughts or contact us, please don't hesitate to do so. Also, if you'd like to feature in a future episode or know or think, can think of somebody that you'd like to find out more about or is an inspiration to you, please get in touch. Please like, comment and share. And we'll we look forward to the next episode of the Sibsey West Midlands Region vlog and podcast.